Hi there. Today I want to talk about the stock and flow model of housing. This is a really cool model that looks at the supply of housing as being both inelastic in the short run and elastic in the long run and price as the mechanism through which new housing is developed. Um, I really like this model because it's a very realistic model. I think it's one of the better models of how housing works and it helps us understand a couple of things. It helps us understand how rent control be can be really problematic. It helps us understand how we can have short-term housing issues. Um, and it helps us really understand the kind of housing issues we see in the marketplace today. So I'm going to go through sort of a general example and a couple of applications here with you, um, starting out by setting the model up. And this model is weird because we don't have a traditional supply and demand model. What we have instead is a short run supply and demand of housing. And then we have, and that's sort of the stock of housing model. And then the flow is the second part. And the flow model is where price acts as a mechanism or a trigger or a signal to developers of whether or not housing needs are, needs are being met. So let me show you what I'm talking about. And get some colored pens out here so we can have fun with it because we will need colors to explain what we want to say. So we start out with the kind of straightforward part, which is the, and I'm going to do it this way actually, the stock of housing. And what we're meaning when we talk about the stock of housing is this idea that in the short run, housing supply is going to be inelastic. It's not going to respond to changes in price in the short run, because in the short run, we can't just make new housing, right? It takes a long time, especially in say California, where we have a complicated process of building permits and a lot of restrictions. It takes a long time. You can't just build housing as it's needed. It takes at least maybe a year, two years, depending on the kind of housing we're talking about. And so we want to start out with an inelastic supply of housing, perfectly inelastic supply. The next thing we want to do is start out with our demand curve and our demand for housing. We don't have to worry about too much because really we just want to set some kind of placeholder demand. We can imagine it being relatively elastic or inelastic. That's not the important intuition of the model. The important intuition of the model is that in the short run, housing is set at some initial level and there's some price associated with housing at that level. So I've got P0 and H0 or P0 and H0 in here, and that is indicating our initial place. And this should make sense, right? In the short run, we can't create new housing if there's a housing boom, if there's increased demand. It takes time to create new housing. So how does that work? We've got the stock part here. The flow part over here says that there is an upward sloping supply curve for housing in the long run. And so in the long run, housing is going to respond to changes in price. Um, as prices go up, firms will respond by supplying more housing. And so we're gonna call this S delta because it's the change in housing. And it's gonna be either positive or negative depending on prices. So positive supply of housing means build more housing, right? Prices are high, we need more houses, build more. If the sign is negative, if the signal is negative, that means prices are low, there's not enough housing demand to you know, use up the relevant supply, we don't need to develop more housing. Maybe we need to demolish some housing or let some housing fall into disrepair. And so the market is in equilibrium here when there's a zero signal, right? When there's not a positive or a negative. And that's, that's our equilibrium stock and flow model. And so what we're saying here is that in the short run, housing supply is fixed. Demand is downward sloping, and there is an equilibrium price. That equilibrium price sends a signal to the flow component of whether we need to add more or subtract housing. In equilibrium, we have the appropriate amount of housing, and we just want to maintain that stock, that H0 level of housing. So maybe it's, you know, uh, 500 or 50,000 housing units in the city or something like that. Well, that's the appropriate quantity of housing. So we start out whoops, with this equilibrium where we have the stock and the flow. And then to really understand how this model works, we want to use um, impose a shock. 
And so what I'm going to do is do something that I use in Econ 180 all the time in urban economics is the recent example of a lot of people moving here to Sacramento from the Bay Area, right? We see a lot of people moving here for affordable housing or more housing for your dollar. And what does that do to the stock and flow model? More people demanding housing is going to shift that demand curve out, right? Super straightforward what we're used to seeing in markets. So we have an increase in people coming to the marketplace, so more population in Sacramento, it's going to lead to an increase in demand for housing. So we're going to shift that demand curve up to D1. And what's the effect going to be on price? Well, prices are going to go up. Housing gets more expensive as demand for it increases. And that makes sense, right? That stock part we're used to seeing you know, an inelastic supply curve, demand shifts up, prices go up. What happens though is this price comes over here to the flow component and sends a positive signal. And the higher the price, the stronger the signal to build more housing. So in this case, this price is pretty high. It's increased by a decent amount. So there's going to be a signal that says, hey, build some quantity of housing. And that so we could call it, um, maybe we want to call it, oops, my pen's giving me trouble. Uh, the signal could be called signal M, and that's some quantity of maybe a thousand more housing units or two new apartment complexes or something like that. And that's going to be a signal to increase, oops, the housing supply to this new level to return us to equilibrium. And that's what we expect to happen if everything goes smoothly the way it's supposed to. Does that kind of make sense? And so price, increased demand, increases price, which sends a signal to increase the supply of housing uh, by the same degree to which prices went up. And so prices are positive or negative, right? Prices either go up or down. It sends either a positive or negative signal and the degree to which the signal, the size of the signal, the degree of the price increase is going to influence the increase in housing and get us back to our equilibrium with some new higher quantity of housing. Hopefully that makes sense. Let me know what you think. Um, this model comes from a couple of places. Um, it's used in the Jan Bruckner Urban Economics textbook, um, and there are some papers that formalize this model. Um, and so we can see how it works in a perfect situation when we have a price signal that functions appropriately and there's no disturbances to the market. We can also see how a, uh, we can use this model to see how a shock to the market can alter market conditions, right? It can help us understand why the market lags or is slow to respond to an increase in demand and an increase in price, right, that time constraint. Um, we can also use it to explain why rent control would be a bad idea or any limitation on prices or purchasing. So let's say we have the exact same situation, right? Increase in population, increases demand, raising the price of housing, um, which is going to have the effect of increasing the supply of housing, right? So let's continue that out, higher prices means an increase in the supply of housing. Does that make sense? If we have a rent control rule, that's going to cap the price of housing unnaturally. So let's say this is the rent control price. I'm just going to put it there. I'm going to call that PR. At the rent control price, now, even though demand is up here, the rent control price is the signal that's sent to developers. So developers can't truly perceive how high demand is because they can't see the market price. The market price is hidden from them by rent control. And so what that means is they don't know how much demand is pent up in the market, how much additional unmet demand for housing there is. And so they're going to go ahead and build new housing according to that rent control supply. 
And so that would be our new supply curve. We're still not going to get down to the lower prices that we would expect without rent control. And so it's going to delay the effect. It's going to keep us at this H2 when we'd rather be further out. Um, the more restrictive the rent control, the worse the situation is going to be. And we can also think about other ways that rent control could harm the housing market because it's also sending an additional signal beyond this signal. It's sending an additional signal that more rent control rules might come in place, um, more restrictions on building, um, and more restrictions on developer profits. And so that's one of the main ways that this model is used. This model is used to explain changes in population, um, the effects of rent control. And we can also take it the other way. We can look at the effect of a decrease in price on the market. I'm going to go ahead and start over from scratch here. Um, and so what we would see then is if we have a decrease in population or a decrease in housing demand, it can actually create an incentive to decrease the stock of housing and what that would look like. And we can think about this theoretically. We could be, think about um, in class I make fun of, or I, I kind of pick on the city of Detroit, but that's an example of a city where there's been low cost housing for a long time. Um, and so we can imagine that, um, and we see that a lot of housing is going into disrepair, is not being maintained. And so that kind of functions as a negative signal of, ho um, of housing. But let me show you what it would look like with respect to our model. So let me get it all set up here for you. So here we have the stock and flow model of housing again. Here's our stock of housing with some initial level of housing supply, H1, um, based on price one, D1, and we could have a positive signal or a negative signal. And in this case, we're going to shift the demand for housing in. So maybe we have a decreased population um, which is going to decrease demand for housing, which is going to then have the effect of lowering the price of housing. So if we shift that demand curve in, prices are going to go down, and that's going to send a signal over here that we want to decrease housing by the size of the price decrease, right? Proportionate to the price decrease. The greater the price decrease, the greater the decrease in housing. And this can be in the form of converting housing into real estate, uh, commercial real estate, um, maybe letting housing just fall into disrepair so it becomes um, like a brownfield situation where it's just not useful anymore, um, or just demolishing housing. And in the example of Detroit, what we saw was the city of Detroit no longer giving public utility services to parts of the neighborhood. Um, to parts of the city that were underutilized or underpopulated. They said, well, we're not going to run utilities there anymore. And that basically took part of the city's housing away from the stock of housing in a sense, right? So we can imagine that situation too, where rather than having an increase in demand, we could have a decrease in demand. And that's going to send that negative signal to the market, telling the market, no, we have enough housing. We would actually do well to have less. And so in that case, we would see the supply of housing shrink to some lower level until the model returned to equilibrium. See that? So that's just a quick overview. You'll want to take a look at the actual model uh, for more detail um, or hit me up with any questions you might have. Um, there's lots of applications for this model. I think it's a pretty helpful model to use. Um, and it's a great way to think about housing that combines the reality that it is very inelastic in supply in the short run, but actually pretty flexible in the long run. Um, in the long run, there's a lot of flexibility with what we can do with our housing stock. And um, price is a signal that really helps us understand what we want to do with that housing stock. So let me know what you think, and I'll see you next time.